tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. For decades, many believed that this man, Albert DeSalvo, was one of the most notorious serial killers in history, the Boston Strangler. Now shocking new DNA evidence seems to dispute DeSalvo's guilt, raising a disturbing question. Is the Boston Strangler still on the loose? A 22-year-old college honor student seems to have it all until he is blamed for causing three deaths in a fatal traffic accident. Free on bail, he has disappeared. Authorities need your help to bring him to trial. An ambitious young mother returns to the workforce and crosses paths with a hot-tempered co-worker. The woman is then brutally murdered. And now authorities need your help to catch your alleged killer, Carlos Berdeja. Also, a doctor accused of poisoning his patients and fleeing to Zimbabwe has been captured. This update and more on Unsolved Mysteries. In previous broadcast, we brought you the story of one of the most infamous serial killers in history, the Boston Strangler. At that time, we questioned whether the man held responsible for murdering 11 women, Albert DeSalvo, was in fact guilty. Recently, major new information has come to light that potentially proves DeSalvo did not commit at least one of the murders. Join us as we examine the latest theories and evidence in this intriguing case. Perhaps the real identity of the Boston Strangler will finally be revealed. Today it is quiet, but 40 years ago, these very streets exploded in horror. The year 1962, the place, Boston, Massachusetts. The first known serial killer in American history was on the prowl. Victim number one, Anna Slessers, 55, strangled with her bathrobe and raped with a blunt object. Victim number two, Helen Blake, 65, sexually mutilated and strangled, her bra twisted into an enormous bow under the chin. Victim number three, Nina Nichols, 68, strangled, her nylons tied into yet another gruesome bow. It was only the beginning. Over the next two years, eight more women fell victim to the psychopath. All but one were brutally choked to death in their own homes, their bodies posed in hideous positions. The city buckled under a frenzy of fear and paranoia. Stepping into this maelstrom was Albert DeSalvo, already facing a lengthy prison term for an unrelated series of rapes. DeSalvo admitted that he was a Boston Strangler. A wave of relief and calm passed over the residents of Boston. Order had been restored. The sadistic killer was finally behind bars. But many believed DeSalvo had reason to falsely confess. The first day, uh, put my arm around backwards, right? Right. And then I put the pillowcase around her neck. The first thing that Albert hoped to get out of being known as the Boston Strangler was the fame of it, because he desperately wanted to be famous, even if it were something terrible. His second goal was to avoid a prison sentence. He had apparently been convinced that if he confessed to the Stranglings, he would be sent not to prison, but to a very fancy private institution where doctors would study him. Do you remember tying any knots in it? Yeah, I did. I did. But if he was lying, DeSalvo's confession was uncannily accurate. Well, I think I, um, 
Many investigators were convinced he had to be the killer. That makes two. If you had heard him go into detail and tell you exactly how the furniture was and uh, what it was adjacent to and so forth, you, 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 you know, nobody could tell you that unless they were there. After eight years of research on this case, one thing I'm certain of, and that is that Albert DeSalvo was not the Boston Strangler. There are a number of very good suspects. None of them happen to be Albert DeSalvo. On November 24, 1973, Albert DeSalvo called his former psychiatrist from prison, stating he was ready to tell the truth about the Boston Strangler. But he was murdered that night before he could meet with a psychiatrist. Now startling new DNA evidence suggests the real killer or killers were never actually caught. Was Albert DeSalvo the Boston Strangler? Evidence found on the last victim suggests that the answer is no. Mary! Mary! Mary. On January 4, 1964, Mary Sullivan was found by her roommate, strangled to death and sexually assaulted. In a final morbid gesture, a Happy New Year card was placed at her feet. The killer left semen on Mary's body that the police collected in 1964. Forensic technology at the time wasn't capable of determining to whom it belonged. Mary Sullivan officially became the 11th and final victim of the Boston Strangler. Albert DeSalvo later confessed to her murder. But recently, two families have formed an unlikely alliance to challenge that assertion more forcefully than ever before. The family of Mary Sullivan and the family of her alleged killer, Albert DeSalvo. I never believed my brother was the Boston Strangler from day one. I just want the name cleared, that's all. Uh, Albert was not perfect. Albert did some bad things. Albert was not a murderer. Mary's sister, Diane, also believes that DeSalvo was not the killer. I mainly come here to say hi to Mary, and um, I'm going to try to do my what I can. I'm going to do everything I can to find her murderer, to find your murderer, Mary. To the DeSalvo and Sullivan families, there was an obvious solution to the controversy. One of the most powerful forensic tools ever created, DNA profiling. If the Boston Police Department still had the biological evidence from Mary Sullivan's crime scene, her killer could be found. I made several inquiries to the Boston Police Department, and they told me flat out that they did not have any physical evidence left in the Boston Strangler case to test for DNA evidence. Casey Sherman and his mother, Diane, were then forced to turn to the only evidence available to them, the body of Mary Sullivan. We had to do the exhumation of my aunt's body. It was a horrible experience. We didn't want to do it, but it was our last and only recourse, we thought, and it was the only chance to find her killer. To supervise the exhumation, the Solomons asked for the help of world-renowned professor of law and forensic science, James E. Stars, and a team of experts. We were obviously looking for any seminal fluid. And we do know that seminal fluid will fluoresce under UV light. So we looked and seminal fluid fluoresce. And it also was in the right location for seminal fluid. It's on pubic hair. Could this be the evidence a team had been hoping for? A chilling clue reaching across decades to identify the killer. A sample of her pubic hair was transferred to forensic molecular biologist David Foran and his team. So we examined that and went after that as far as could we get any DNA from it. We had to be extra careful because obviously her hair is going to have her DNA in it. So one of the tricky parts becomes isolating DNA only from this material that's stuck in the pubic hair and not from the hair itself. 
Dr. Foran successfully isolated a DNA sequence from the sample. Foran then compared it to Albert DeSalvo's by using DNA taken from his brother Richard. The results were virtually indisputable. The DNA found on Mary Sullivan's body did not belong to Albert DeSalvo. Somewhat to our surprise, in no instances did we find anything from Albert DeSalvo. It wasn't there. On the other hand, we did find DNA sequences that are from someone, and they're not someone we can account for, despite how hard we tried. A well of emotions came over me, uh, because a lot, there have been a lot of times where I didn't know if we had done the right thing. But uh, when he said that there was DNA, they believed, from Mary's killer on her body, and that DNA didn't match Albert DeSalvo, it was just complete vindication as far as I was concerned. For those who say that Albert DeSalvo did do it, it, the shoe is on their foot now. It's for them to come forward and show the evidence to prove that Albert DeSalvo did do it. As of now, we've got evidence indicating in all scientific probability that he didn't do it. If Albert DeSalvo did not kill Mary Sullivan, then who did? Before DeSalvo's confession put an end to the investigation, the police were pursuing a number of promising suspects. The original investigators of Mary's murder found a strange piece of evidence in her bathroom, implicating Mary's allegedly abusive ex-boyfriend. They found an ascot uh, cut up in the toilet. When my sister dated this person, that's all she bought him for presents. He loved ascots. So I could see him definitely cutting that ascot up in the bathroom, and I could absolutely see him killing Mary. The second suspect is based on an eyewitness account. A neighbor saw a man in Mary's apartment at the approximate time of the murder. So they're giving you a hard time at work, huh? Yeah. What'd they say? They Mary started. Sullivan's roommate had a boyfriend who matched the neighbor's description. Oh, your boss? No, just the other girls. Why don't you just beat them up? The roommate's <laughs> boyfriend may have also had access to Mary's Gotta apartment, present, explaining why there were no signs of forced entry. I don't know. At the height of the Boston Strangler case, my aunt was well versed in what was going on. She wouldn't let a stranger into the apartment. She would have had to have known that man, or that man would have had to have gotten into the apartment with a key. So? What the day say? before Mary's murder, her nice. roommate had spent nice. the entire day the with the prime suspect diner. and Mary's killing. I want a steak. OK, so I'll go to the diner. What are these for? They're the keys to the apartment. An extra set. I'm going to go pat on my nose. That her apartment key had gone missing the day before she was killed. Now, this key hadn't fallen off the keychain. It was taken off. You live in Vermont? No. Do you know the Mary suspect Sullivan? was brought in for a lie detector yes. test. Did you take a key from Mary Sullivan's apartment? No. Did you kill Mary Sullivan? No. Face front, please. According to police, his responses were deemed untruthful. Once DeSalvo confessed, however, investigations into this yes. suspect and Mary's ex-boyfriend were closed. And what about the other murders? Author Susan Kelly's extensive investigation has revealed that the police had promising suspects in many of these cases as well. If Albert wasn't the Boston Strangler, who was the Boston Strangler? From what my research indicates, there wasn't one. There were many. On June 14, 1962, the maniac claimed his first victim, 56-year-old Ann Slessers. Earlier that day, a painting crew was working at her apartment. Sixteen days later, the same painting crew arrived at the apartment building of Helen Blake. She became victim number two. The only thing that connected those murders was a painting crew working on the exteriors of the women's apartment buildings at the approximate times they were killed. Two of the members of the painting crew, their alibis couldn't be corroborated by their boss or by their uh, fellow workers. 
And that's an unusual connection. As was first uncovered by Susan Kelly's research, police also had a suspect for victim number six, 20-year-old Sophie Clark. The suspect in the Sophie Clark case was seen entering her apartment building. He was seen fleeing her apartment building covered in sweat. Are you 27 years old? Yeah. Police identified the man and learned that he had dated Sophie at least once. Do you reside in Boston? He was given lie detector tests on two separate occasions and according to authorities, failed both. Victim number seven was 23-year-old Patricia Bissett. In this case, too, Susan Kelly Patricia. discovered that police had a viable suspect. Patricia? Patricia's boss, who discovered her body. The detectives found out that Patricia Bissett was having an affair with her happily married boss at the time she was killed. Well, I found her autopsy report. It shows that she was one month pregnant when she was murdered. Not only do you have motive, but you have a suspect there. Like the suspects in Mary Sullivan's murder, investigations into every one of these individuals stopped cold when Albert DeSalvo confessed. That there were more than one strangler, there's a possibility that some of the older women died at the hands of the same person. Each of the young women who died was murdered by a different individual who had his own motives. If you hated a woman back in the early 1960s, you could kill her, loosely wrap a stocking around her neck, and hope that the police would think it was the Boston Strangler. I mean, clearly, the killers that were murdering these women, they had a diagram on how to commit a Boston Strangling because all the grisly details were printed in the papers at the time. If you wanted to commit a murder, here was your diagram. The Sullivan family continues to hope that Mary's killer will one day be held accountable. I want closure from my mother. My mother has had to live nearly 40 years without any answers in this case. We want to publicly identify Mary's killer, look him in the eye, and, and tell him what, what he stole from us. Headlight came right, right into the driver's side window. And that's pretty much the last thing I remember. And then uh, I woke up about 10 minutes later, I had glass in my eyes. I couldn't really see much just because of all the glass. And uh, I just kind of looked around and kind of clicked to me that there's no way everybody could have made it out of there. And saw, saw my friends on the road. It was ugly. It was real ugly. Matt Wagner had somehow survived a devastating four-car accident on State Route 270 outside of Pullman, Washington. Three of his closest friends were not so lucky. Brandon S. Clements, his best friend Ryan Sorensen, and Ryan's girlfriend Stacy Morrow. Stacy was my daughter, Stacy Gretchen Morrow. She was 21, gonna turn 22, a student at Washington State University, and just one of the most beautiful young ladies I ever knew. Shortly after the fatal crash, Stacy Morrow, along with Brandon and Ryan, were honored at a Washington State University memorial. I didn't know what to do and I had mixtures, of course, of sadness and just rage that something like this would happen. I mean, nothing's been the same since. It was just a nightmare. A nightmare that should have been, that could have been easily avoided and was totally unnecessary. 
Police believe that Frederick Russell, a 22-year-old honor student, had recklessly caused the accident. He was charged on three counts of vehicular homicide and four counts of vehicular assault. But Fred has his share of supporters. Do I believe that that accident was caused primarily by my son? I don't. I think there were a lot of causes, and I think there were a lot of people responsible for what happened on that road that night. That doesn't make it any better or any worse. That's just an interpretation of the facts. My sense of what Greg Gressel is doing in this case is that he is defending his son beyond a reasonable amount and uh, is making statements that are trying to cloud the issue, spread the responsibility, and excuse his son to try to get this young man off the hook for the deaths of my daughter and Brandon and Ryan. Could Fred Russell have been innocent of the charges against him? Russell is from a respected family whose father is the chair of the Criminal Justice Department at Washington State University. He doesn't believe Fred is solely responsible for what happened that night. But the victim's families vehemently disagree. This tragic case has split the college town of Pullman, Washington into warring camps. Many believe that only the driver that night, Fred Russell, can stop the outbursts of rage and grief. But Fred Russell is nowhere to be found. How are you, big guy? Doing good? Investigators have pieced together Fred's activities in the hours leading up to the deadly crash. Uh, I think I will have a drink to that. Several witnesses claim they saw Fred and his friend Jacob McFarland drinking at a local bar. I'm driving! I'm driving! At approximately 10.15 p.m., Fred and Jacob were seen leaving the bar. Wow. <laughs> Fred then got behind the wheel and headed onto Route 270. Lady, pick it up! According to police reports, Fred came upon a slower moving vehicle in front of him. Lady, you're moving at like 10 miles an hour. Oh, son Although of he was in a no passing zone, Fred oh, illegally man. tried to go around the car at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> police believe that Fred's Chevy Blazer first struck a geo prism heading in the opposite direction. Then a Cadillac carrying seven college students. Brandon Clements, Ryan Sorensen, and Stacy Morrow were killed on impact. Matt Wagner and three other students were critically injured but survived. The Blazer then smashed into a third vehicle before bursting into flames. Amazingly, Fred Russell and his friend Jacob escaped relatively unscathed. What's that? Yeah. Two hours after the accident, Fred's blood alcohol was tested at a nearby hospital. Uh, it measured 0.12, well above the legal limit. Later, Fred Russell was arrested at his home and charged with three counts of vehicular homicide. Fred Russell's bail was set for $5,000, which his father, Greg, had no problem posting. Fred would remain free until his trial. In fact, he was even allowed to drive to and from work. Oh, that was pretty hard to take. You know, when you lose your three friends, it feels like somebody murdered him. Kind of feel like the guy should be behind bars right away, and he, he shouldn't be able to be out, be out in public anymore that the bail is so low as to be nothing other than a slap on the wrist is almost insulting to victims and their families. And we believe that he poses no flight risk. There now, whether there was a personal connection between Judge Frazier and Greg Russell, the, the dean of the School of Criminology at WSU, I don't know. Uh, I do believe, though, that Greg Russell's standing in the community was one of the reasons why Frederick Russell was allowed to be out on bail and why that bail was so low. I would imagine that 99.9% .9 of the time, most judges in this country in the same situation would have done the same thing. 
public anger began to grow as Fred's team of lawyers prepared his defense. A motion was filed disputing the blood alcohol finding, and challenges were made as to whether Fred was really responsible for the accident. I was shown toxicology reports of the, uh, the deceased driver of the Cadillac that indicated there were drugs and alcohol in his system. I was shown toxicology reports of other occupants that showed that there were drugs and alcohol in their systems as well, uh, meth and marijuana. There was absolutely nothing in the system of the decedents that contributed in any way either to the collision or to their subsequent death. I think that the accusation by Greg Russell uh, that uh, is clearly intended to cloud the issue of his son's responsibility in this case is sinful. Within weeks, Fred Russell and his supporters claim that he became the target of the community's growing outrage. You're gonna go to prison for a long time, you worthless piece of trash. I hope to God you get raped in prison, you worthless piece of garbage. You're a scumbag, you're a loser. The death threats that he indicated that he received were two phone calls in July, early July. I hope someone puts a bullet in your head. I hope if your mom's still alive, um, and then we received information that a card was left at the front doorstep um, of, of the residence that he was at, um, indicating that he wouldn't live to see his trial. Four weeks later, Fred Russell disappeared. Both his lawyers and family claim to have not heard from him since. Shortly after he jumped bail, Greg Russell and several local newspapers received a letter signed by Fred. It read in part, I left because I had no choice. Since the first day after the tragic accident, horrible things have been printed about me. Now people are so enraged that they would rather see me dead than receive a fair trial. I maintain my innocence, but my life has been repeatedly threatened, so I cannot stay. Fred Russell's whereabouts are currently unknown. I think Fred has an expensive lifestyle. I think Fred's um, accustomed to good things. Uh, being able to go out and party and drink and socialize. Um, I, I th would find it impossible for Fred to make his uh, ends meet without assistance in some manner from some family member or friend. Since that letter, nobody in the family, to my knowledge, has heard anything from him. Um, we don't know anyone who has heard from him. And I would hope that if anyone did, if any of my friends knew, if anyone in the family heard from him, that they'd tell us. What I would say to Frederick Russell is, we'll get you. You can't hide forever. And I've got a long time left in this life, and I'll find you. Ten-year-old Joanna Molina of Merced, California, will soon be reunited with her mother, Jean. Jean Molina has recently moved to Tustin, four hours to the south, and is now ready for her oldest child to join her. Jean was real happy because Joanna was going to come and live with her, and we made, a, we made arrangements to take her down that weekend. Two months earlier, Feeling a need to take a sabbatical from her marriage, Jean had taken a job as a cook. It would be a chance to assert some independence. However, other forces may have prompted her move as well. She had had a dream that I was going to badly beat her up, and she felt that she should get out of my house. And I never understood why she would have a dream like that and believe that dream. When her parents and Joanna stopped by Jean's new home, no one was there. Not knowing where else to turn, the Hitchcocks checked the restaurant where Jean worked. 
Excuse me, miss. Yeah, I'll be right with you. Do up. Thanks, Carla. Yes. Is Jeannie here? Jeannie Molina? Uh, Jeannie, no. She didn't come in today. But maybe we made a mistake. I was just um, really not sure what to do. Because Jean, if she said she was going to be there, she would have been there. The next morning, the Hitchcocks rushed to Jean's room hoping to find a sign of her. Sadly, there were no clues to where she might be. It was very difficult because at that point we were so worried. And Joanna, she kept watching me. She wanted to see how I was reacting, how frightened I was, or, or how bad the situation was by my reaction. Oh, excuse me, sir. The Hitchcocks immediately went to the Anaheim Police Department to file a missing persons report. Yesterday, we were supposed to meet with my daughter. Deep down, I did know that something was very wrong. But I tried not to think about it because I knew that it would just make things worse. Joanna and the Hitchcocks returned home empty-handed without a single clue to Jean Molina's whereabouts. Over the next several days, they would anxiously wait by their phones, hoping for news that Jean was safe and unharmed. Sadly, that call would never come. Jean Molina was raised in Merced, California. Following a tour of duty with the Navy, Jean returned home and began a family. She married Frank Reed and had three children, Joanna, Elizabeth, and John. Though she and Frank had their ups and downs, it was a fulfilling marriage. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of respect for each other. She just had all of the things that I've always wanted. I mean, she was, she made me want to be married for a long time. But when her youngest child was two years old, Jean felt a need for some changes in her life and decided to go back to work. Merced is such a small town, and she didn't feel she could go far here, so she went to Southern California. Jean's experience as a cook in the Navy helped her land a job with a restaurant chain. Within six weeks, she had been promoted. She was going to be training all of, new, of the new hires at each restaurant as they opened up. She had planned to take Joanna with her, so. It was kind of, it was going to be kind of a neat experience for her. She was real excited about it. She was real happy. Then just when everything was going so well for her, 33-year-old Jean Molina vanished. The very day the Hitchcocks drove to Tustin to see Jean, a gruesome discovery was made in Westminster, a town 10 miles away. The badly battered body of an unidentified woman was found near an abandoned construction site. It was one of the more vicious crime scenes that we've investigated, and we've investigated an awful lot of homicides. Just after daybreak that Sunday, a husband and wife witnessed a man acting suspiciously near his car. He picked up some type of uh, a large object, and we later found that to be a piece of asphalt, and with both hands above his head, just thrust it down hard and then looked up and saw her, and in her words, she panicked, and he jumped back in this compact vehicle and sped off from the scene at a high rate of speed. We didn't feel that robbery was a motive. She had some money on her. She had a ring on her finger. Um, we felt that probably under the circumstances, uh, the suspects that did this Newer in some way. They were trying to prevent us from finding out who she was. I don't even know what race she is. Can you tell I mean, she was so badly damaged that we couldn't tell if she was a female Asian, white, Hispanic. An autopsy revealed that she had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and bludgeoned before being run over by a car. Three days after Jean Molina vanished, her landlord read a newspaper article about the unidentified female victim found in Westminster and thought it might be Jean. He immediately contacted authorities who contacted Jean's husband. Hey, Detective Solinsky. Thanks, John, appreciate it. Possibly the um, most difficult thing in my life I ever had to do, to go down and identify somebody who was beaten so badly she was unrecognizable. This ring was found with a victim. It wasn't until Frank was shown the ring the victim was wearing 
that he was certain his beloved Jean had been murdered. I'm, I'm really sorry. Well, Frank called me and told me that he had had to identify the body. I didn't handle that very well. That was a horrible week, and it was the day was worse, but somehow at least, I can't say it was a relief. It was just, it made me angry. Despite Jean's dream about her husband beating her, investigators were able to quickly eliminate Frank Reed as a suspect. I've kind of come to believe that the dream wasn't about me. It was a dream about something else, and she had foreseen what was going to happen to her. Detectives went to the restaurant and questioned Jean's co-workers. What can I do for you guys? Dan, the reason we're here. One of the things we found out was that she had worked on July 16th, uh, just about to 11 o'clock at night. One witness stated that she did come back after signing out on the time card. Uh, she did come back and, and talk to this particular individual for a few minutes. That individual was short order cook Carlos Berdeja. Surprise! Hey! Did you guys have to go for the coma? I'm glad you made it. Investigators theorized Jean might have left with Berdeja to celebrate her daughter's impending arrival. I thought they were all going to come with us. She'd already bought a bed for her daughter. She'd already stocked up the refrigerator. I mean, this was an exciting time for her. This was something that she was really, really looking forward to. Uh, Carlos? Police would soon learn that Carlos Berdeja reportedly admitted committing a previous murder. Uh, he's got a temper. OK, can you tell me what that means? Uh, you know, I was working one day, and I and, uh, was just joking around with him. Carlos, Maria will never go out with you on account of your ugly. The line cook thought it was just minuscule. He was just kidding with him. And he said the guy just went off and pulled a butcher knife out and threatened him with the butcher knife. You're talking to us. That's not funny. Look at the outside. Juegas conmigo. Yo te mato. Yeah. I killed in Mexico. Berjeda then came back in, according to the person that we interviewed, the next day and had some kind of paperwork with him stating that he was wanted someplace in Mexico for an additional homicide. He came in the morning, but he didn't show up at night. Jean's co-workers also informed police that Carlos Berdeja had abruptly resigned from his job. Yes, that was Sunday. When investigators went to Berdeja's residence, they learned that he and his common-law wife had vacated the premises the day of the murder. Uh, he left his clothes behind? Some of his clothes, you see. Yeah, he... That afternoon, another neighbor caught Carlos Berdeja behaving oddly around his car. Berjeda was then seen attempting to clean out parts of the vehicle. Oh, wait, hold on. The sedan registered to Carlos Berdeja was later found abandoned nearby. The car provided a wealth of physical evidence in the case. Evidence not only in the vehicle, but on the undercarriage of the vehicle that secured in my mind with beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, this was the vehicle that had been used to run over uh, Jean Molina. Authorities have been searching for Carlos Berdeja ever since. They believe he may have additional wives and families in Mexico who are helping him evade capture. Well, I hope they catch him. And I just hope to be able to tell him what I think of him. Eres un cobarde. Te escondes abajo de la falda de tu madre. You're a coward and you hide beneath your mother's skirts. Carlos Garcia Berdeja is wanted for the murder of Jean Molina. Berdeja is 37 years old, five foot seven inches tall and weighs 180 pounds. He is adept at creating aliases and should be considered extremely dangerous. On a previous broadcast, we profiled a suspected serial killer who fled halfway around the world to avoid being charged with murder. In a remarkable twist of fate, he is now in custody. The story of Michael Swango is a bizarre one. As a medical student, he used his hospital internship to secretly kill. When mysterious deaths occurred on his watch, hospital officials became suspicious. When co-workers became ill, they believed Swango was poisoning them. Swango represents the ultimate betrayal. We trust doctors. We put our lives and health in their hands. And Swango held himself out as someone who was willing to help, but in fact, he was looking to hurt. 
Using various aliases, the doctor spent years evading the law. And when police began to close in, he quietly fled to Zimbabwe, Africa. Soon after, authorities issued a warrant for Swango's arrest for the only thing they could, fraud. He had lied on a federal job application. That warrant would eventually come back to haunt him. Update. Three years later, Swango was fleeing Africa to Saudi Arabia, but had to stop in the U.S. to renew his visa. At Chicago O'Hare Airport, an alert customs agent ran his name through the computer, found the warrant, and Swango was arrested. It was June 1997, and little did officials know that they had captured possibly the most prolific serial killer of the century. Nothing compares to Swango the unbelievable, strange motives that he had and the length of time for which he did it and the number of times he got away with it. I mean, nothing compares. While serving time on the fraud charge, federal prosecutors had three years to develop a murder case against Swango that could put him away for life. We had to prove that there was a homicide. Normally, that's not a problem in a murder case. You have a dead body, there's a bullet, there's a stabbing, there's a strangling, a beating. In this case, people had, been, had passed on and it had been assumed that they died naturally. Exhumed bodies, complicated toxicology tests, an eyewitness and even Swango's own diaries sealed the deadly doctor's fate. Page after page of his personal writings are filled with morose texts like, I love it, sweet husky close smell of an indoor homicide. We can tell from Michael Swango's writings that he simply liked to kill people. For him, the thrill was doing the killing and getting away with it. And that's why it was difficult to establish a pattern with him, because he was something of an opportunistic killer. He would kill whenever he had the chance to kill. Join me next time for more fascinating stories from the realm of unsolved mysteries.